Uh, thanks a lot uh, for your uh, introduction and uh, the kind invitation. Uh, can you uh, hear and see me and see my slides? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, great. Yeah, so uh, I think there is some uh, motivation uh, for uh, robot competitions because uh, yeah, the evaluation of uh, robots is not that easy. Yeah, so um, if you um, evaluate uh, your robots in just uh, your lab with a self-chosen task, then uh, yeah, it is often impossible to compare results. And uh, often uh, there is a video produced uh, and this proof by video uh, has the same difficulties as uh, proof by example. So maybe it worked once, uh, but uh, you don't really know what kind of assumptions uh, were made. And uh, hence, yeah, there is uh, an increasing number of uh, robot competitions and challenges that uh, bring together researchers, but uh, sometimes also students or enthusiasts. Uh, and yeah, there are uh, some uh, examples of these like uh, RoboCup or the DARPA Robotics Challenge uh, or yeah, uh, challenges in uh, Abu Dhabi. And uh, the advantage is that uh, there is a standardized uh, test bed. Uh, you are not in your own lab, but in a different environment and uh, your robot must perform at the scheduled time. So that makes it possible to directly compare uh, different approaches uh, to the hardware, to the software uh, and the like. Yeah. How do I stop that sound? Yeah. Uh, bipedal soccer. Uh, yeah, has been going on for quite some while. So overall, uh, RoboCup uh, yeah, formulated the vision to win against uh, the FIFA World Champion. And uh, the footage that you see here is, I think, the first uh, humanoid uh, soccer games that uh, we played against uh, the team of uh, Martin Riedmiller uh, at uh, German Open uh, 2005. Uh, as you see, uh, we used uh, the RoboSapien toy robot uh, that uh, could already walk uh, and we replaced its head uh, with a pocket PC and cameras uh, to see this uh, the soccer world and uh, yeah, to control uh, the robot. Uh, since that, then uh, we constructed uh, more and more uh, soccer robots, but uh, we also uh, constructed uh, humanoid robots for other uh, application domains uh, like uh, domestic service, as you see here, or uh, mobile manipulation for the DARPA Robotics Challenge and for the DLR Spaceboard Cup, and most recently also this uh, telepresence uh, robot for the ANA uh, Avatar X Prize uh, competition. Yeah. Uh, these uh, soccer uh, competitions for humanoid robots, uh, we started with relatively uh, small ones in the so-called uh, kid size league. And uh, at the time, uh, Team Osaka uh, was the leading team, uh, but uh, yeah, our robots uh, improved uh, every year. And, and you see that uh, already at uh, 2008, uh, these games, they were quite uh, dynamic and uh, yeah, uh, even uh, exciting, I would say. Uh, one of the key components there uh, was uh, omnidirectional walking. So uh, we developed uh, a gate that we can tune uh, with uh, forward speed and uh, lateral speed and uh, turning around uh, the vertical axis, which uh, is based on a central pattern generator. So. Uh, the rhythmic uh, shifting uh, of the weight, uh, the leg shortening, and then uh, swinging in, in the walking uh, direction. But uh, yeah, that is very flexible. And uh, we uh, constructed larger robots uh, over the time. So we uh, moved on uh, to the so-called uh, teen size league, 
where uh, you see here uh, some footage uh, from uh, RoboCup uh, in Eindhoven. And yeah, falling is uh, actually part uh, of this game. And, and you see that uh, the robot uh, that uh, was falling is actually getting up uh, and continuous uh, playing. It uh, even yeah, uh, takes over then uh, and, and scores uh, a goal. Yeah, takes a second. Yeah, to maintain a uh, balance, uh, Marcel Musura, who graduated uh, with a PhD from my group, uh, developed uh, this capture step uh, framework. So uh, we use a linear inverted pendulum uh, model and uh, decide uh, when and where uh, to make uh, the next step in order to regain balance and control uh, walking. So uh, depending on the estimated uh, uh, center of uh, mass movement uh, and uh, the predicted uh, center of mass uh, state, uh, then uh, the gate is uh, adjusted. Uh, Marcel, uh, implemented this approach uh, first uh, with this uh, yeah, robot that we called uh, Dynapad. And you see that uh, yeah, one can uh, disturb uh, the robot and then uh, yeah, foot placement and also the timing of the step uh, is uh, adjusted. We looked also at learning learning uh, to adjust uh, the step. And the interesting part here uh, is that uh, learning is uh, based on a physical model so that uh, initially the robot uh, makes uh, roughly uh, the right movement, but uh, it doesn't work yet. But uh, yeah, essentially from the first uh, mistake, uh, the robot uh, does learn to adjust uh, its uh, foot placement so that uh, it can survive uh, such a push. Yeah, so that uh, yeah, function approximator is uh, updated uh, while the robot is, is making the first mistake uh, and then uh, yeah, it actually uh, survives that. Yeah, so here uh, it wasn't sufficient, uh, but uh, for the next uh, push, uh, it actually uh, survives. Of course, uh, we also need to uh, perceive uh, the scene, and uh, for that uh, we developed, um, yeah, uh, different kind of uh, camera-based uh, perception to see the goalposts, uh, to see the field lines, uh, the ball, and uh, other obstacles. Uh, this works uh, in real time, as you see here, and uh, you see also uh, one of uh, our uh, first uh, 3D printed. Uh, robots. Yeah, so this was uh, together with Egos company uh, based on uh, the Nimro uh, OP robot. Uh, we would uh, have a project there to yeah, develop a 3D printed uh, robot. Uh, Philip Algoyer, who graduated uh, from my group uh, with a PhD, uh, looked at uh, yeah, fused angles and uh, different kinds of feedback uh, mechanisms uh, to uh, adapt uh, not just uh, the gate, but uh, for example, also arm movements uh, of the robot uh, in order uh, to uh, maintain balance. And then, yeah, different kinds uh, of disturbances uh, can be uh, tolerated uh, without uh, losing balance. But uh, obviously, uh, when you switch it off, uh, the robot uh, may fall. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, falling is uh, part of this game. So we also look at uh, yeah, landing motions uh, that uh, minimize the damage. And yeah, afterwards, uh, the robots uh, need to get up uh, in order to uh, continue uh, play. So we developed uh, different kinds of uh, getting up 
uh, routines that uh, sometimes also uh, reorient uh, the robot uh, and then uh, the robot uh, is, is getting up. So you see these, um, yeah, teen size uh, robots uh, here in uh, RoboCup uh, 2016 uh, playing. And yeah, we use them uh, together uh, with the older uh, Dynapad robot that was uh, upgraded, uh, as you see, with the head um, to the software uh, of the new uh, humanoid platform robots. We continued uh, developing open platform robots. Uh, you see here the first uh, adult size uh, robot uh, that we constructed uh, from uh, 3D printing uh, in its structure and that we uh, released uh, open source. So uh, it has a parallel uh, kinematic structure uh, in the legs. And uh, in some of the joints, uh, there is uh, external gearing uh, to have higher torque uh, because uh, the robot is actually driven by these uh, relatively small uh, dynamics actuators. You see, uh, they are very densely packed uh, in the knee. So in each knee, uh, there is actually eight uh, of these actuators uh, that uh, control uh, the uh, leg uh, shortening. Uh, and uh, also uh, yeah, the pitch direction. So uh, these robots uh, performed uh, very well at uh, RoboCup uh, competitions, uh, as you see here, 2017 uh, in the uh, adult size final. But you see also, yeah, that uh, they are not the fastest ones. Marcel continued uh, to work uh, on his capture step uh, framework and ported uh, this uh, to these uh, larger uh, robots. So the robots can walk uh, in an omnidirectional way. Uh, as the small ones uh, before, but um, in addition to that, uh, they uh, adjust uh, the foot placement uh, and uh, the timing of the step uh, based uh, on uh, yeah, the estimated uh, balance and this uh, capture step uh, framework uh, of Marcel. So uh, you see here that uh, the robot waits until it comes back. Uh, if it's disturbed uh, laterally. And uh, yeah, if we uh, disturb the robot in the uh, sagittal plane, then uh, it does uh, adjust uh, its foot placement. And yeah, it can actually uh, sustain uh, pretty strong pushes. And, and regain uh, balance. Unfortunately, uh, in the adult size class, uh, getting up uh, is, is not really part of that game so far. And uh, hence, uh, we didn't really uh, develop this robot uh, for falling uh, so far. So, so that would be one of the future challenges of larger robots. Yeah, we uh, continue to use these uh, robots uh, in, in the competitions. Uh, you see here uh, 2018 uh, footage and uh, also some uh, of the uh, visual perception uh, of that robot. And we have a newer version developed. Uh, the X means uh, that it's uh, based on the X series uh, actuators uh, from uh, Robotis Dynamixel. So they yeah, uh, are uh, easier to control and uh, also uh, a bit uh, stronger. 
So we use them uh, in the uh, OP2X version of that robot. For the visual perception uh, of the game situation, um, we develop uh, deep learning based uh, methods. And uh, this is a UNET structure, which is uh, executed uh, on the onboard uh, GPU. So in the uh, chest of the robot, there is a strong onboard computer with an Intel uh, quad core, a CPU, and uh, an NVIDIA uh, GPU. And we have uh, two outputs here. Uh, one is uh, for object uh, detection, uh, like the ball or the goalposts or other uh, robots. And uh, one is for semantic uh, segmentation, for example, to find the field uh, and the field line and distinguish it uh, from the background. And uh, these methods uh, are uh, quite robust at this point. So we can detect objects that are hard to recognize even for humans and uh, tolerate uh, different uh, lighting conditions. Uh, they work in real time, so the robot uh, can keep track uh, of the ball. And uh, also, for example, here uh, in the technical challenge, uh, uh, kick a moving ball. Or, uh, yeah, it was also uh, able to uh, kick a ball over uh, an obstacle and, yeah, sustain uh, pushes. We developed uh, for this competition uh, in, in Sydney uh, an inline kick. So you see that uh, the robot uh, doesn't really uh, stop for kicking, uh, but uh, it can kick uh, while walking. And, and this uh, yeah, leads to dribbling and uh, to uh, much increased uh, game performance. So we keep the ball uh, moving more often and, and uh, yeah, won this uh, competition. Uh, Diego Rodriguez, uh, who graduated with a PhD from my group, looked at uh, learning an omnidirectional gate uh, from scratch. And yeah, he uh, has a policy that is described uh, by a neural network that maps uh, the state estimate uh, towards uh, increments uh, in the joint uh, positions. And he has a simple reward structure, like uh, tracking uh, the desired uh, velocity, um, having the robot uh, being upright and, and not fall. And he uh, started from uh, relatively uh, slow uh, walking uh, and then increased step-by-step uh, step, uh, the walking speed so that uh, in simulation, uh, he would learn an omnidirectional gait uh, that uh, also could be uh, transferred uh, to the real robot. But uh, I must also say that we didn't really uh, use that for the competition. Andre Brandenburger uh, in his uh, master thesis uh, looked at uh, deep learning based uh, navigation that is uh, yeah, taking images uh, as an input and learns uh, to encode these images uh, in some uh, abstract state space. And based on that, uh, it, uh, this approach uh, that is an extension of Dreamer, uh, which also takes into account, uh, yeah, uh, for example, balance uh, measurements, uh, predicts uh, how the state would evolve. And it also predicts uh, reward and, and value so that uh, during inference time, uh, we can generate uh, navigation. Uh, so the robot uh, walks. Uh, while uh, avoiding uh, obstacles uh, towards uh, a goal. And this doesn't just work uh, with uh, stationary objects, but uh, also with uh, dynamic obstacles, uh, as you can see here. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, there was uh, two years uh, no competition uh, due to uh, Corona, but uh, in this this uh, year in Bangkok, uh, Thailand, uh, there was again a RoboCup uh, World Championship. And for this competition, uh, we upgraded uh, our robots. So uh, we replaced uh, the camera by a higher resolution uh, newer model because uh, this, the field size uh, was increased. 
and uh, we had some difficulties uh, seeing faraway balls, for example. Uh, so this uh, camera has an even wider field of view, as you see here. Uh, we also upgraded uh, the GPU to the newest model so that we can uh, process uh, online uh, high resolution images. Um, and uh, this year, uh, also the ball uh, was variable. So we didn't really know which ball we would uh, play with. So we augmented uh, training data with uh, multiple ball designs to recognize balls irrespective of their particular texture or design. And that led to a more robust perception for faraway objects and the field lines. You see here uh, detected uh, objects. You see here well segmented uh, field lines that uh, were also used for localization, uh, which improved in this way as well. We uh, extended also uh, the omnidirectional uh, gate with uh, uh, kicks that are uh, in many directions, not just in forward uh, directions. Uh, we uh, improved uh, the state estimation. And uh, yeah, now uh, the kicks are adaptive to the relative ball position and can kick uh, in all feasible uh, directions. So uh, you see here, uh, for example, uh, during the game, this is very useful because we don't need to precisely align the robot anymore, but it can kick uh, to the side, it can kick uh, diagonally, but uh, yeah, it can kick uh, more strongly in, in forward uh, direction. We uh, also improved our uh, debugging tools. So we have a graphical tool uh, that uh, visualizes uh, live many uh, important uh, things, uh, for example, where we see obstacles or where we want to kick uh, and what the robot is trying to do. Uh, some things are also visualized uh, using curves. And uh, you see here uh, yeah, how we use that in our lab uh, to optimize, for example, uh, the ball approach uh, and, and kicking. Yeah, overall, um, these improvements uh, worked out. And uh, also in this year, our robots uh, scored uh, many more goals than uh, the second best team uh, at uh, RoboCup uh, in, in Bangkok uh, in summer. And uh, yeah, you see uh, the robots uh, walking in an omnidirectional way, uh, maintaining balance uh, also when disturbed. And, and kicking uh, quickly in, in many uh, directions. Again, there were uh, technical challenges uh, like high kick or uh, maintaining, uh, surviving a push or uh, kicking a moving ball. And uh, yeah, our team uh, won uh, all the competitions uh, that uh, we could win in, in at Robo Cup. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we developed uh, yeah, capable bipedal soccer robots that won uh, the international uh, Robo Cup championships uh, in adult size in recent years uh, multiple times. Uh, they are based on a, a 3D printed structure uh, the visual perception is based on deep learning uh, on, on board with the GPU uh, is the inference done. We have an omnidirectional gate uh, that maintains balance with capture steps. Uh, the robot can uh, kick uh, in a flexible way in, in many directions. And we have uh, developed uh, yeah, powerful debugging tools uh, to uh, yeah, visualize uh, and understand uh, the robot behavior. The, Hard and software of the robot is open source, but uh, of course uh, there is many things uh, to do. Uh, for example, uh, I would like to have a running robot, but the current actuators, uh, they are limited. And uh, we are looking at quasi direct drives uh, to uh, construct a new robot uh, that is supposed to run as well. Uh, then the, uh, yeah, control of uh, the movement of the robot uh, must be improved uh, towards really dynamic uh, whole body motion. And uh, Greg Ficht is uh, working in this direction. And uh, yeah, we are also uh, thinking about other applications beyond soccer, 
uh, for example, uh, personal uh, assistance. With that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and are open for questions. Great, thank you, Sven. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Hello. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, it is amazing that uh, Nimbra team achieved great results for every global competition. Uh, that means uh, Nimbra team uh, tried to resolve uh, any common issues of the robotic system uh, that happened on the borderline between laboratory and real world. So I have a question to you. Uh, as long as I uh, understood from your video, the push recovery um, in retro state, on the latter plane, the push recovery works pretty well, but uh, uh, it's just like you unactivated push recovery execution in corona plane. Is, is it to avoid uh, self collision? So my question is, do you have any idea for self collision issue on the corona plane? Yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if I got the question. I think it was about uh, self-collision. Um, and uh, yes, uh, that there is uh, an issue in, in the lateral uh, plane. Yeah, so uh, the construction of the robot uh, doesn't uh, allow to, to cross uh, the legs. Yeah, so uh, that means we, we are quite uh, limited uh, in, in foot placement uh, and in, in the lateral uh, direction. And uh, for example, if we are tipping over uh, to the outside uh, foot, then we, we essentially uh, just can wait. Uh, and uh, the only thing uh, we, we could do at this point is uh, yeah, do, doing uh, something with the upper body to, to add uh, some uh, momentum there. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the robot uh, construction does not allow uh, to crossing laterally of the feet. Uh, which would be needed in order to place the other foot uh, on, on the uh, outer side and uh, yeah, uh, withstand uh, larger uh, pushes uh, on, on the lateral side. Uh, if we are pushed uh, inwards, uh, then we can adjust uh, the foot because uh, yeah, it is uh, just moved to the outside, but there uh, the time is, is critical. So uh, there uh, the speed of the actuation is, is one of the limiting factors. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, at this point, uh, we are looking at some other actuators, but this is ongoing work. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. Especially I like that we got a glimpse of the timeline of the evolution, which was quite impressive of the uh, performances but um do you know if because your designs are open sourced do you know uh, whether other teams use them also or if not why not because if you're so successful then i'm surprised that the other teams don't try to build on that and just do that one extra step instead of do the thousand steps thank you very much yeah so with regards to uh the Nimbro OP platform uh, that was a smaller robot, uh, about 90 centimeters, and also the Ego Sumanuit uh, open platform uh, that has been picked up uh, by some other teams and, and others uh, added modifications to that. Uh, and, and we are quite uh, happy about the reception uh, with regards to the uh, Nimbro OP2 and OP2X uh, robots. Uh, yeah, I was also a bit. Uh, wondering why others uh, wouldn't pick it up. And uh, one of the factors uh, might be, uh, actually there, there was uh, yeah, at least one team uh, from uh, Czech uh, Technical University uh, that uh, tries to reproduce the robot, but I'm not fully aware of, of the status of that, uh, but uh, not many. And 
one of the factors might be increased costs. So uh, the smaller robots, they, they are uh, less expensive um, and uh, easier in, in some respect to build. The larger ones, uh, yeah, they, they cost more. But uh, if you compare them uh, to yeah, professional uh, humanoid robots of that size, uh, it's still maybe 10% of the costs or 20% of the costs. So they are much more uh, affordable. And uh, also, they are quite lightweight. So you can handle them uh, just uh, by picking them up uh, on, on a, a handle and, and uh, yeah, if you have a very heavy and, and powerful uh, humanoid robot, it's uh, much e much more difficult to, to work with. Yeah, so uh, I, I was really wondering why uh, not so many teams uh, picked up that. Uh, and uh, I introduced uh, personally uh, the uh, adult size uh, 3D printed robots um, at Humanoids Conference uh, in Beijing. Uh, 2018 and yeah I, I think there were some missed opportunities and of course one of the factors is uh, that we are not a company we are a university and we cannot easily assemble and sell robots so if we would do that uh, that would make things much easier but we, we are not in a situation uh, that, that we could actually produce robots and sell them 